and we are recording. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Boris, and thanks um, very much for the invitation. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. So I'm I uh, am a going to be talking to you today about uh, species on the move, how species are redistributing under climate change and how that influences how we might do a little bit about how that might influence how we do conservation planning. Okay, so the question that motivates my research is how does life respond to environmental change? And I don't need to make strong projections because we already have um, a, a history of environmental change happening over the last uh, 50 or now more like 70 years, we have, uh, we have recorded change in the climate and in the places that we've been doing good monitoring, we can observe how organisms and ecosystems have responded to climate change. And so in bird species, for example, we have really great long-term studies uh, from the, uh, from the collective citizen science um, from the National Audubon Society looking at how the latitude in bird. So we, we can now look at how the latitude of bird species ranges have marched towards the poles over the last uh, 56 years. Similarly in the oceans, we can, we can see uh, a track of marine species towards higher latitudes. And so this is uh, showing a compilation of North Atlantic species uh, from the Ocean ADAPT program. We also know that species range shifts impact people. Um, they've occurred globally and uh, they, they impact not only the ecosystems, but uh, people, uh, the way we govern and uh, the way we make use of resources. So this uh, was a review study that just brought together species range shifts that we've been tracking uh, and the evidence towards which that we found that they influence ecosystems, they influence human well-being or culture, they influence governance, um, be it conflicts or, or new new regulatory uh, decisions, uh, or times when they lead to climate feedback. So. Um, when plants uh, start to come invade in the in the north, we know that they are changing uh, the way light is reflected, and they're changing the the local climate, um, leading to further temperature change. Okay, and they, they impact people. So here, I'm just pointing out this one down here. There's a sea urchin off the east coast of. Uh, Tasmania in Australia. And this is um, quite a famous story now of sea urchins uh, moving southwards with climate change uh, to previously cooler waters where um, they've decimated kelp forests um, and um, led to sea urchin barrens. And that's uh, of course really affected um, the way people know and use their eco, the, this coastal region, and it's also influenced uh, fisheries in that region. Okay, so we know species ranges are shifting, and one of the other things we know that makes it complicated is that they're shifting, they're not all shifting at the same time. So I've got uh, a bunch of studies that, um, that sequentially sort of point that out, and it's also being shown elsewhere. Um, as we bring together all of our evidence on species range shifts, we see that it's, it's, it's either idiosyncratic or there's some noise or there's problems and noise in our ability to detect range shifts, but we know that the shifts that we're seeing are not all happening at the same time. So this sort of sets part of my research agenda, which is to ask what determines species range boundaries and what does this mean for conservation planning, this um, variation in the rate at which species are shifting their, their ranges. Okay, so a central tenet in ecology and biogeography is that climate influences continental scale distributions of species. So for a uh, frog species in North America, we would expect that it's something to do with cold or ice or the duration of the summer that limits their distribution at the Northern range uh, and something to do with heat or desiccation resistance that limits their range at the Southern end of their range. But uh, ecologists have long proposed that 
climate doesn't directly spe determine species ranges at both range boundaries. But in fact, at the warm range edge, uh, they might be influenced more by biotic interactions. And so this was uh, uh, written by Darwin and described um, uh, as a sort of uh, uh, diffuse competition mechanism. So more and more competition at the southern range boundary or the warm range boundary might lead to, um, might set the limit for certain species. Uh, it was also built up as an evolutionary argument by Dobzhansky, thinking about how evolution occurs differently at the cold versus the warm range edge. Uh, and then uh, uh, further by MacArthur. And so we have some classic studies that, that illustrate this concept. So in intertidal studies, the work of McConnell shows just this concept of how you might have a two barnacle species that uh, for one, the, 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 the benign range edge, the range edge that's less exposed for this brown species of barnacle is limited by, uh, I'm getting this wrong. No, the, 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 the more extreme, the, the benign climate competition is thought to limit the range edge of the, now I've forgotten which one is which. I'm just gonna leave it there, but one of these is limited by competition and the other is limited by the abiotic uh, factors. Uh, nope, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna leave it open. You guys can correct me in the chat. Um, I, when we look up mountain ranges, we see uh, the similar thing. So this one's easier for me to think about because I thought about it more recently. Um, as we go up mountain ranges, we find that uh, through experimental studies that competition limits the lower evolutionary range edge of plant species uh, while more often while abiotic factors limit the poleward range boundary of plant species. And so these are done by transplanting plants, transplanting their other organisms that they're with, transplanting their soil, and, and finding that it's more often abiotically limited at the cold range boundary. Okay, and so this is um, kind of important to the way that we start to think about distributions. Classically, biogeography, I would argue, has thought about distributions uh, in a, an ought ecology framework. So we think about a population and its environment. So uh, we might expect that the species has a variable population growth rate across temperatures or some other environmental variable, and that predicts the population size. More and more, we're, being, we're realizing that uh, how other organisms interact with a focal or organism is really critical. And so this sort of pushes us into this other framework of ecology called syn ecology. So thinking about species interactions. We know organisms live in multi-species environments. So it would be false to ignore what, how all the other species are also going to respond to temperature change and how that's going to influence species interaction. Okay, so understanding the factors that limit species distribution has been a central tenet of ecology for many years. And ideally, we would now be able to summarize all of that information uh, and make predictions about how species are responding to climate change. But as I alluded to, we also know that now that we have observations, where we have observations of climate change responses, we can use those to test our predictions. Um, and so we can actually use those to, 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 to test the hypotheses that we've built up over years. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about um, the sort of three components of my research program that, um, that I'm applying to help prepare for this redistribution of life. First is to predict. So um, I'm gonna talk about um, applying um, ecology basically to predict climate change responses. The next is to observe. So uh, using climate change responses that we've observed over time to inform how we, how we uh, our ecological knowledge. Uh, and then the final is to engage. So engaging with partners. And I'll just give you some examples of how, what we're doing in my lab. And I know many people um, at, at Dalhousie and all of the partnerships that you've built are, are already doing this quite a bit. So 
it'll just be a fun discussion. Okay, so uh, to what extent do thermal limits match latitudinal distributions? This is a, a question that um, could help us to think about, okay, do, do these geographic distributions of species relate to their fundamental thermal niche? Or are they offset? Do species, um, are their geographic ranges not limited by their thermal tolerance limits um, or by temperature? And that would give us the indication that something else limits them. And then we can start to think about what it is or, or dig in to what it is that limits species distributions other than temperature. And this has been a, a relatively uh, difficult question to answer. We don't often measure geographic ranges and uh, ecological niches, even though we talk about it a lot in ecology. But as it turns out, uh, there were um, hundreds of years of thermal physiology data in which people have been measuring the thermal limits of species in the laboratory environment. So that either the heat limits or the cold limits um, and uh, there are two main limit types that people use. They either look at the, the critical thermal limits, so they ramp the temperature and they, uh, they, they, they uh, take the temperature at which the organism loses critical motor function, or they, um, or they place the organisms in a static temperature and they um, do a regression basically to assess the temperature at which 50% of the organisms uh, died. So these are two different metrics, uh, but they're the main two that people use. So there's lots of data in each category. Uh, and so I brought together a whole bunch of these thermal tolerance limit data, keeping track of the categories and also some of the methods that people use that differ um, for all sorts of ectotherm ectotherms, marine and terrestrial. And so we can then look at um, we can use those thermal tolerance limits to estimate this thermal window or this thermal breadth. And then we can estimate the potential latitudinal, we can, we can, we can get data on occurrence uh, from occurrence records of where those organisms exist um, and um, you know, clean those up as much as possible so that we can then ask to what extent does the thermal tolerance breadth match the, the temperatures that the organism is living in. Okay, so we might find that there is a, a match. So the potential thermal range matches the realized range. We might find that, the, um, that there's a mismatch in which the thermal tolerance breadth is wider than the realized range. So the potential thermal range is broader than the realized thermal range. And there we would uh, deduce that there's underfilling of the thermal potential. Or we might find uh, a different kind of mismatch, which is that the realized range actually extends further than what we predict based on the thermal tolerance limits. And so there we would call that overfilling. So the mechanisms that so we expect to see all sorts of underfilling and overfilling and variation, they might have to do with the way the, the assumptions that we make when we make this comparison and what temperature data we're using, you know, and it might have to do with ecology and, and what it is that's limiting species range boundaries. Uh, so the first step is just to, to make an assessment um, across as many species as possible. And so here I'm going to show you what we found when we looked at uh, terrestrial and marine ectotherms. And we looked at their warm range boundaries and their cold range boundaries separately. And up on the uh, positive part of this uh, axis is overfilling. So I have a little cartoon to illustrate it down here. So giving away my answer. Uh, it's going to be overfilling so those times when species ranges are their realized range go beyond what we expect and if it's negative it's underfilling so it's time when their realized range uh their, their realized range doesn't extend as far as we expect it to okay and then there's a cartoon down here below that illustrates it so for terrestrial ectotherms we found that on average with variation, they underfill their warm range boundary. So in other words, they don't live as far down towards the equator as we expect them to based on their heat tolerance. Um, and at the cold range edge, we find that they overfill their thermal potential. So they live further towards the poles than we expect them to based on their cold tolerance. 
And for marine species, there was some variation, but on average, their realized thermal range matched their potential thermal range. And so this is um, quite a stark contrast between the terrestrial and the marine sort of range filling syndromes. And when you dig into here, this overfilling and this underfilling, I mean, the amount of overfilling and underfilling that we see is kind of similar. So that might um, bring into mind some mechanisms that would explain the offset together. But um, in fact, uh, what we think is happening is that at the, that there, logically, there would be different mechanisms that it couldn't explain this offset. So at the cold range edge, a species might be living further than we expect it to because they are able to go dormant during the winter time or they're able to find micro habitats that allow their body temperatures to be warmer than the air temperature. So in fact, it was pro possibly an error of our um, estimate of the potential thermal range. Uh, and so currently I'm actively working on that uh, with a larger data set, uh, bringing in dorm winter season and summer season dormancy. Um, at the warm range edge, it's possibly, um, it, it, that, that mechanism can't explain it because we're seeing underfilling. And so the mechanisms that most logically explain this are that there's either um, moisture or habitat. So something other than temperature limits them. So it could be moisture very easily or some other aspect of the habitat that doesn't exist that is, is keeping them from living further towards their thermal potential. It could be um, limitations that have to do with the variability or the complexity in temperature. So we're using, um, we can use the warmest temperature of the year that we can gather from climate data, but this is always an average and it doesn't get the, the warmest, you know, heat wave that actually constricts a species from being able to live there. Uh, or it may be that this acute thermal tolerance isn't a good metric of what the population level thermal limit is. Um, and so we're working on that as well um, to try to tease out these mechanisms. And of course, a last mechanism is that terrestrial species are indeed limited more by biotic interactions at their warm range edge compared to, um, compared to thermal uh, temperature limits. You really can't be here right now. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, whereas, okay, so these mechanisms can best explain those, uh, that offset. And I just forgot to mention, I just wanted to point out that these method, you know, when you do these analyses, you're bringing together really disparate data. So we need to account for methodological variation across studies and for taxonomic non-independence among, among all of these species that we're bringing together. Uh, but these results, like the, the, the mean and error line that you're seeing here, um, account for all of those sources of non-independence. Okay, and so what this means is we uh, predict, we can, regardless of which of those mechanisms we think uh, is at play, um, in, in most of the cases, we still predict uh, that terrestrial species at their warm range edge are going to be less sensitive to climate change than marine species. Um, and so um, this is our major prediction then coming out of those, those observations. And uh, in a recent paper uh, that I worked on with Malin Pinsky, who I know uh, has recently done a seminar with at Dalhousie, uh, we observed 159 range edges uh, over, we, we gathered together observations of 159 range edges over the, the recent last half century and found that that were attributed to climate change and found that indeed 27% uh, of observed range edges in terrestrial ectotherms uh, were observed to contract as and attributed to climate change, whereas over 50% of the marine range edges uh, were observed to contract. So um, it, the, the marine species at this core scale uh, and accounting again for lots of variation among the, the data that we're bringing together at this core scale, the marine species appear to be more sensitive to uh, climate change at their warm range boundary. Okay, so from this, we can start to conclude the marine range edges seem to better fill their potential 
the thermal potential, and they're twice as sensitive as terrestrial species at their warm range edges. Okay, and we can also look at uh, the, the patterns of thermal tolerance across, la oopsie, across latitude. Um, and so uh, this is just, just giving you the raw data here, seeing what, how the upper thermal tolerance limits and the lower thermal tolerance limits uh, in marine species uh, going from zero, you know, across absolute latitude on the, on the x-axis here. Um, both decline with latitude. Um, and there's some differences here between species that um, live, the intertidal species and marine species. Marine species are sort of uh, their, the, their boundary here is at about negative two degrees Celsius um, because water just can't get colder than that. Um, and then uh, without freezing. Uh, and then um, on the, in the terrestrial realm, we see that heat tolerance, it varies among species, but it doesn't have this, it, this um, systematic decline with latitude. Uh, whereas their cold tolerance does just as we would expect. So this invariance of heat tolerance across latitude and terrestrial species has led to all sorts of, um, you know, interesting studies about, you know, what, what is leading to their, what has led to this evolutionarily, and what does this mean in terms of their climate vulnerability uh, of, of all these terrestrial species. And uh, one of the things we can do then from that is we can compare the upper thermal tolerance limit to the experience temperature. Um, that's our, our best guess of the, the warmest experience temperatures that species are currently encountering um, on, on a re relatively regular basis. So through, through the climatology. So um, on this plot, I'm showing you the black points are the upper thermal tolerance of uh, marine organisms, marine ectotherms. The uh, red points are what their body temperature, our best guess uh, of their body temperature at the surface of the water on the hottest day. And then the orange is our best guess of their body temperature on the hottest day at depth. So by guess, I mean, you know, we're using uh, climate data, um, inter climate data across, uh, you know, gridded climate data, and then we're um, accounting for um, different behavioral abilities of, of species that can go deeper and how much cooler we expect them to be able to cool their bodies. Uh, but we can still then ask uh, how much thermal safety do they have? So how much warmer is their, how much higher is their thermal tolerance limit compared to these body temperatures? Um, and uh, it gets complicated to show these data, but in this paper, we show that the the upper the, this thermal safety margin, this difference between the heat to tolerance, uh, upper upper thermal tolerance, and the experience temperatures, is smaller for marine species than it is for uh, terrestrial species. I could show you the data. I just didn't want to. It, it it blows up into a much larger part of my talk, so I've just left that out. But please have a look if you're interested in, in that comparison of uh, thermal safety margins. Okay, and so this leads us leads um, me to think about, you know, so so we can bring together all these data and, and they're coarse, they're macroecological, it's um, data to try to assess the uh, relative vulnerabilities of major groups of species or vulnerability across latitude. Um, and it's had me to stop to think about how we do prediction in ecology. And so, of course, uh, in classical evolutionary ecology, we talk about prediction in the form of uh, predicting findings. So we have a hypothesis. The hypothesis leads to a concrete prediction. And then we test that prediction with observations. So we're doing that repeatedly uh, in hypothesis testing. Whereas in uh, conservation and management, for conservation and management decision making, we are sort of being asked or we're putting, we're wanting to make projections uh, into the future. So this is a different kind of prediction, projecting future. So, um, so I often just call that projection for short because it's just easier to keep the distinction. So here's future time and here are projections. 
Okay, so under predicting, we're doing hypothesis testing, we're corroborating our theories or finding evidence that corroborates theories, and we're building knowledge. Uh, and there's lots of really exciting work being done to try to do a better job to unify um, all of these sub-disciplines in ecology uh, to bring together, you know, physiology with community ecology, um, lots of exciting work uh, using metabolic theory to, to help with scaling across or convert across scales. So, um, so if we can make a un more unified ecology, we might be able to make it a more predictive science in that we'll be able to predict, test those predictions and, and th that, that come out of that unified ecology. Under projection, of course, we wanna make forecasts, project projections, build scenarios. Uh, this applies our knowledge. So we take all of this knowledge we've built and we apply it and we expect here to have more policy relevance uh, and uh, information that can directly inform decisions. And so where I try to work um, is right in this nexus here. So, you know, how do we build knowledge? What is the knowledge that we need? And then that can inform what is the knowledge we need to build. And um, so I'm not going to have time to go into this, but I wanted to mention in case there were, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I like to collaborate a lot and I'm in Canada and I'm really happy to meet you all. And so um, some of the work that I do in prediction is again, de developing a, a more uh, a more cohesive, so, so instead of thinking about thermal tolerance limits, now thinking more in this curve view of how population growth rates increase and then decrease with temperature, um, thinking about local adaptation in thermal tolerance, uh, and um, making predictions about the outcome of competitive interactions, uh, all using metabolic scaling theory. So that's one body of work that I do. And then another is more in the projection realm. And so here, um, uh, building projections or working with climate, climate, um, Eco, uh, climate oceanographers uh, to make to to build downscaled climate projections, and then thinking about what the biological responses will be, um, making predictions about evolutionary uh, and biodiversity responses to ocean acidification. So more in the projection realm here. Okay, and so then the idea is that we uh, can build our hypotheses, and we can even build projections. Uh, and then we can make observations in the real world because we've had so many years of climate change uh, in front of us and other forms of global change that we can, um, I think it's really important to use those observations to test and refine our hypotheses. So um, this section I'm gonna talk about uh, observations. And this idea of using observations to uh, understand the limits of species ranges uh, wasn't, is, was, was at, um, as far as I can tell, first um, written by Odom in 1958, possibly by somebody else before that. Uh, but Odom wrote that sometimes a good way to determine the factors that limit organisms uh, is to study their distribution and behavior at the edges of their range edges. Uh, and then uh, when they undergo a sudden or drastic change, this sets up a natural experiment, which is often superior to a laboratory experiment. So, you know, we can do as much as we can with these laboratory experiments of uh, thermal curve, performance curves or thermal tolerance limits, um, but by observing species range distributions across uh, the natural experiment of uh, climate change and global change that we've had, we can test um, our hypotheses and learn more. And so when we look at range shifts through time, uh, we can, um, it's, I, I have sort of noticed that it, it's really important to talk about what a range shift is and how our perception of range shifts might differ depending on what part of the range we're thinking about and also what kind of species we're thinking about. Um, but for here, just on the range uh, edge topic, you know, at, at the cold range edge of a species range where uh, here it's easiest to think of, you know, as an organism now with climate change has an opportunity for increased population growth or immigration. Uh, so the questions there are, how is it gonna get there? What is the habitat like? Does it have viability other than 
the temperature or, or, or is there other combinations of the climate that might limit that species? Okay, but we can borrow, to some extent, we can borrow theory uh, that we've already developed in uh, invasion ecology. Similarly, at the uh, warm range edge of species, here the species is, um, we predict it might, or we presume it's going to experience decline. Um, we might be thinking about how an organism leaves, it emigrates from that area if it's mobile, or uh, how just the population declines uh, through lower birth rates or through greater death rates. So here we might borrow a uh, theory from extinction theory. Um, and we might think about what it, what it takes for a, a population to persist um, through, through, through environmental, a variable environmental change. Um, and then other times people think about the, the midpoint of the species range. So this, you know, sort of conflates these two, uh, these two and, um, and more uh, processes. So I really think it's important to think about those processes at either end. And so here now I'm going to take you down to the uh, east coast of Australia, where um, it has been a climate warming hotspot um, over the past uh, half century again, um, warming about four times faster than the global average. And uh, particularly in Tasmania, so the island down here off the south, this is where species had been arriving that fisheries biologists and also regular uh, people who, who either uh, fishers or uh, people who interact with the ocean just notice that species are arriving. They're noticing new species that haven't been there uh, in their written recorded history and they're not in their guidebooks. Um, and so I headed down there and uh, uh, collaborated with people who had been doing studies of um, uh, doing surveys up and down the coast uh, over time uh, to ask if we can tease apart any further what explains the variation in which species are extending their ranges, which ones aren't extending their ranges. And so this is what the uh, temperature pattern looked like in this area. So along the, um, the this plot is showing the temperature and the color um, along latitude on the y-axis and uh, years on the x-axis and the temperature that is representing is is the coastal margin uh average temperature of the the coastal uh margin um so the what you you can read this two ways you can look at um you can just slice a straight line um through time and you can sort of see what the color is of the temperature at a certain latitude uh, or you can follow an isotherm. And so here I'm showing the 20 degree Celsius isotherm, and then you can see how it's moved uh, across latitude over time. And so that's a little bit closer to illustrating climate velocity or where a certain isotherm has moved over time. And that um, establishes a prediction, a baseline, a novel expectation of, of how we expect species ranges to have moved. And then overlaying on top of this, I can show you the southern range boundaries of marine species, so invertebrates and fish, all coastal invertebrates and fish, um, from surveys that were done. Most of these are two time point surveys. So it was survey done, a, a latitude, a survey across latitude done at one time point, and then another survey across latitude done at a second time point. And it's compiling seven independent latitudinal field study programs. Um, you can see that you can expect there's noise in these data. I mean, they've with only two time points of observation, um, we're making a guess at where we think the range boundary is, but we don't know how variable it is between years. But uh, we can still see that on average, there's a mean shift towards the south, uh, and that's in the direction that we expect. You can also see that here off the, the southern point of Tasmania, I mean, there's a southern point after which you no longer can observe these coastal species. And so uh, that's sort of in, interesting in and of itself that those southern range boundaries are, are simply not to our knowledge able to extend further. 
Okay, and so each one of these, just to keep orienting you, each one of these lines represents one species range boundary. So here's the southern range boundary of this barnacle species, and here's the southern range boundary of a Wobegong species across time. Okay, and so then our idea was to ask, can ecological traits explain species differential range shift responses? And so here I'm going to borrow from invasion ecology, where we predict that an invasive species uh, would be more successful based on its potential to arrive into a new area beyond its range and then to establish in that area into a viable population. And so um, are the traits that we associate that that we were able to get um, for all of these species that um, that we could see as being a, a proxy for arrival ability are uh, adult mobility, um, larval dispersal ability. So what this was came down to larval dispersal mode, but predicting that species that have long larval duration can can um, arrive, they're more likely to arrive beyond their range. Um, and species with larger body sizes would, in a way that would affect their, their mobility um, and that would also uh, increase their, their arrival rates. And so these were hypotheses that exist in the literature that people have been postulating uh, and subset to the ones for which we could find data for as many species as possible. Okay, and then for establishment, you know, you're predicting, trying to think, trying to find traits that could predict an, uh, an organism's ability to now contend in this new, uh, in this new place. So uh, a new community, maybe uh, having a broad diet breadth would help you to establish. Um, there had been conflicting predictions about how trophic position would help you to establish sometimes. Uh, the thought being that a high trophic level uh, species would establish faster, potentially being more of a generalist. Um, other predictions that lower trophic level species would be better at establishing, um, being um, being more connected, being at a, being at a more closer connection to the changes in their resources. And the latitudinal range size prediction, I'm gonna illustrate for you in a second, but the idea was that species with larger latitudinal ranges uh, can extend, are more likely to establish beyond their range. Um, and so this is what that prediction looks like. So species with larger latitudinal ranges, we expect have gr greater local abundance um, based on just some fundamental macroecological patterns. Um, and that could lead to greater propagule pressure, greater dispersal. So that's more of an arrival variable really. Uh, and then the other prediction is that if you have a larger range, you're also more ecologically versatile. So this sort of, the intuitive version of this is, you know, if you have a small range, you're possibly, you're more likely limited by some ecological mismatch. There's some reason you need to be in that small range and beyond that range. You could possibly tolerate the abiotic conditions, but there's something to do with the habitat or with the other species that are limiting your ability to be there. And so I illustrate that in this way. So uh, imagining a species with a large latitudinal range and one with a small latitudinal range, and the prediction being that something other than temperature uh, is more likely to limit species with small latitudinal ranges. Um, so, uh, and, and this, there's um, biogeographical work that supports this hypothesis. So I'm going to illustrate what we found. Um, you know, we had a lot of variables, uh, not a lot of data. And so we fit um, models that had reduced numbers of variables. And then, um, and I'm gonna show you the results from the multi-model averaging. So, uh, and there's just a whole bunch of stuff here, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So on um, first, uh, we found that trophic position and uh, how trophic position interacts with uh, the climate expectation, the actual amount of the, the distance at which the isotherms moved across time, see, ah. um, predicts um, had, a, had a positive uh, influence on were positively associated with species 
range extensions. Um, and this was a categorical variable. So it was actually the omnivores that had the fastest range extensions and that were more responsive to climate change. We found uh, as expected that species that had high mobility. So if you are a swimmer rather than a crawler uh, or a sessile organism, you had you responded more quickly to climate change. Uh, but we also we also found that um, you know some some results that weren't significant or that that weren't certain anyways was the the relationship between reproductive mode uh, and the interaction between reproductive mode and mobility in how organisms were extending their ranges. So um, I could talk more about that, but that we you know even though we had brooding organisms that that were the offspring. Um, just sort of emerge out of the adults. Uh, and then we also had species with long pelagic larval duration. Both species types uh, had, some of them had very fast species range extensions and others had poor species range extensions. Okay, and then this one uh, was the, the effect of the latitudinal range size. So species with larger latitudinal ranges had faster range shifts. Um, and I'm gonna illustrate you, okay, so this is the result just with the fish. Um, and here the latitudinal range size uh, was that influenced the pace at which range edges uh, responded to the climate change. And here's what that result looks like. Um, so I'm going to orient you on the x axis here is the climate expectation. So how far we expected the isotherms to move uh, during the, the duration of that study. And on the uh, y axis is the extent of the polar range uh, movement. So the polar range extension. And the point size is the study duration. So this the analysis was weighted by study duration. And uh, the larger uh, the black points illustrate the species with larger latitudinal ranges. So, you know, we found this faster range um, extension in these species with larger latitudinal ranges than in smaller ones. So there's probably so much more to pull out of, of data like these, and especially if we can find um, more you know, data with, with better time series. Uh, but just to show you what these large latitudinal range species look like, you know, the point being they are both large and small body size, different dispersal modes, but what um, makes them similar is they all had these large latitudinal ranges. Okay, and so, so yeah, stepping back, you know, this, we had, so we had a bunch of data, it's, it's very, it's difficult to have data upon which people look at latitudinal, you know, they do these large latitudinal gradient transects, and they do them over time. And so we can be opportunistic and we can look back, we can fit our very best models and, and build these traits uh, data bases so that we can um, do our best to understand uh, the variation. Um, but I really do believe there's so much more we can do. Um, okay, so, so from this study, we could say, oh, well, Possibly narrow range species may be in double jeopardy uh, because they're slower at uh, responding to climate change. And we also know they're intrinsically more vulnerable as small range species. Um, and then further that swimming adults and generalists respond quicker. Um, and sorry, I should explain the generalist comes from those the omnivore findings so omnivores and swimming adults respond more quickly. And so I'm involved in uh, this sort of species on the move research group where we're trying to bring together as much clean uh, systematic data um, that can speak to species range shifts um, so that we can uh, you know, do our best of making of the fact that we have change has occurred over time. It feels like we need to be making observations and using them to refine how we make predictions into the future. Um, and so my PhD student, Jake Lawler, is working further on this. And he's really been digging into, uh, in the cases where we have really good time series, and these are uh, Eastern seaboard uh, species um, coming out of the Pinsky lab. 
um, asking how we can um, how we can refine how we detect range shifts, um, and then thinking more about how range shifts can be related to life histories. Um, but I do strongly believe that our ability to synthesize range shift data is limited by what people measured in the past and have reported. And we've kind of uh, exhausted all of these opportunistic data sets that we can find. And so at this point we need to be making, you know, you've heard it a million times, we need to be making better observations. Uh, and one of the places where I uh, tend to work most is on the Pacific coast of Canada. This region is predicted to be a climate change corridor, and there are very few latitudinal surveys that are repeated along this coastline um, that are systematic and through time. And so one of the things we need is a systematic standardized survey of presence absence data. And we need it to be repeatable across frequency and time. And so this has uh, inspired me to um, dive into um, the approach of using environmental DNA metabarcoding to, um, to track lots of species uh, across time and space. And so um, just to give you a, a little primer on environmental DNA metabarcoding, the idea is you uh, sample seawater um, because marine organisms tend to release DNA in the form in all sorts of different forms of cells, gametes, and waste. Um, we can it floats around the water for kind of just long enough, so 12 to 24 days. Although research on this is is continues. Um, that we can sample the seawater, uh, filter it, extract DNA, uh, do PCR with, um, met with meta barcode primers, so, so general primers that can uh, amplify across lots of species and that can, uh, that can resolve species to organisms to the species level as much as possible. Uh, and then uh, put this through Illumina sequencing to do this bioinformatics work and then to uh, to detect to, to use a reference database to try to identify the taxonomic group of all of those sequences. And so the final product then is a species by sample matrix, something that that biodiversity ecologists work with all the time. And so I'm sort of I've delved into this uh, through a partnership with the Hakai Institute. Uh, where they have already basically been doing this work uh, as oceanographers looking at microbial patterns of variation, uh, but now just changing our primers so that we can focus on metazoa, so fish and invertebrates. Um, and so we can, um, we're, we're having success in identifying uh, lots and lots of broad um, taxonomic groups and resolving a really large portion of those to the species level. Um, and so our work now is focused on using eDNA metabarcoding to do something like a, a spatial analysis across a coastline. Um, so we can get to this next step of doing it through repeating, making this an observatory that continues through time. So our questions are how different are metazone communities across space when we sample them with eDNA? Um, what makes a confident species detection? So we're digging all into multi-level, multi-species occupancy modeling so that we can really use the fact that you can repeat survey with eDNA. We can um, uh, use that to its strongest ability to, to, to try to detect, to um, estimate our detection error. And then how many samples are needed? This is like the hundred dollar question, no, the million dollar question. So if you were going to establish an eDNA observatory, how many samples do you need to be confident? So this has to do with our error rate, this has to do with spatial variation, um, and it's a question that needs answered. And, and ecologists do this, this, this is the first step of doing a biodiversity monitoring. So, so this is kind of where we're stepping in. And then the idea is then to deploy a sampling program across space so that we can send sampling kits to partners and they send back their samples. Uh, and then of course, we wanna make the most use of this as possible. So I have a portion of my students are really working on uh, building a species traits database and, and trying as best as possible to establish interactions between those species. 
Okay, so I'm just watching the time. I know I'm kind of nearing the end, but the um, I, I'll just t talk on this um, last point more briefly. Um, and so, you know, we've, I've talked about making predictions and then testing those predictions using observations. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really important if we want our work to be um, to, to, to either have the potential to be used or to actually inform decision-making is uh, to engage with partners. And by partners, I often all, I, I, I'm gonna emphasize the people who make, who are working on the ground in conservation and management decision-making. Although, you know, all sorts of collaboration is a great way to inform how we do, how we can do all of this hard work uh, with, uh, in a more thinking outside of the box. Okay, and so just thinking about conservation and management, um, Gilles Soutin, the chief scientist at Parks Canada, has um, noticed that species range shifts is going to lead to a complete shift up in even how we describe what the how we describe our the Parks Canada mandate. Um, you know, if the mandate is to preserve uh, ecosystem integrity. Um, what does that mean if we know the species are shifting uh, into new distributions? And he will say there is no new normal. And this one is interesting because I think it, we have the tendency to think species are going to shift and then that will be the new place now. They're now in this place. But in fact, as long as as far into the future as we can project climate change, we might also project that these distributions are going to continue to change. And also because some species, because species differ in their pace of change, you know, we can expect change to be the new, the new thing. So there's not just a new future we're projecting. Okay, and so these are just some examples of uh, partner engagement that helps me to try to work in a nexus that will help me to build the ecology and evolutionary sort of building blocks so that we can uh, change how we uh, can inform decision making. So, so thinking about species range shifts, uh, one of the questions I'm really interested in is um, when should we expect range shifts to conf conflicts over jurisdictional boundaries? And I know Malin probably talked about this in his seminar and um, we and part of a, a larger working group where we're working on, on what the, the legal implications are and the implications on rights. Um, so that's been really interesting. Another is um, how well does thermal, so working with uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, how well does thermal tolerance predict population decline? So um, I, at the beginning, I showed you what, will, you know, how we can make, we, we can relate thermal tolerance limits to geographic ranges, but um, we're making some huge assumptions uh, when we when we use thermal tolerance to think about climate vulnerability, and that is that we need that link between climate tolerance and population growth uh, or decline. And so um, I'm working digging into that question. Um, probably won't. Well, I can just quickly talk about. Um, my collaboration with Parks Canada, so asking how, if eDNA can clarify how kelp restoration affects uh, the whole community. So it's just applying eDNA just as an ecologist would apply anything else, um, but hoping that that can give us a more thorough window in a short amount of time of, of a restoration scenario. Um, and I've been working, so I'm gonna, these two I'm gonna talk about more. So, um, one is this question, do marine protected areas increase resilience under climate change? So, uh, you know, probably many of you have had this experience, you're, you're a climate change ecologist or whatever the thing is that you sort of work on, you're now invited to come and give advice uh, for an actual concrete management decision. And so here the California MPA um, network is going through their decadal management review. This is an amazing network of marine protected areas. And they're, they wanna know, you know, how have they done? Do they need to make some changes? If so, what? And how have MPAs provided climate resilience? And so um, this sort of has helped me to focus a lot of my work now. So having done for them an extensive review of the evidence for um, how how uh, marine protection could increase resilience at organism population ecosystem and then social coupled social ecosystem ecological systems 
has helped to focus, you know, what evidence do we have? And there is evidence uh, as many of you, I know some people here study specifically. Um, and um, uh, and the interesting thing is that most of the time that there is some, of course, it makes sense that most of the time that there's some climate resilience, it's through species interactions. So that's kind of something I'm really interested in following up on. And then this um, uh, is just turning towards MPAs in Canada. Marine protected areas in Canada are large, they're deep, they're all over the place and um, they're hard to get to. And we're about to have more. So um, we've, um, the Trudeau government is uh, committed to have covering, you know, we've just jumped up to 14% of MPA coverage in Canada, and then we're going to go to 20, supposed to go to 25% in 2025 and 30% in 2030. The shocking thing is we barely monitor those MPAs. Um, this is what I've learned through my discussions with um, Emily Rubidge and Ryan Stanley at uh, DFO. And so we're working on developing um, just testing the feasibility of using eDNA for MPA monitoring. And here again, the big question is how does certainty in biodiversity estimates uh, increase with effort? Um, and, and then is there sort of like, where's the sweet spot so that we can, we can um, give good advice towards whether or not it's worth this large investment in doing um, of using eDNA for biodiversity monitoring? And if so, how exactly, or how, what's our best uh, advice about how to set up a monitoring program? So this is um, a really exciting project that we're now um, work, um, funded through Genome Canada. Um, and so the, and the objective is to optimize the eDNA approach to monitor biodiversity in Canada's MTAs. Okay, so, um, I'll just to summarize then, I've talked about how species ranges are limited by temperature. And I've showed you that marine species ranges better conform to their thermal limits. They have lower thermal safety and they have shifted more. I've uh, asked, do species traits explain variation and uh, of species range shifts? Um, and I've shown you that larger ranges, uh, fish and omnivores have had faster leading range edge shifts. And then through engaging with partners, to showing you how it informs my science. Okay, so thank you very much. It was really, um, I have enjoyed putting this together for you guys. And um, I, as you can see, I'm sort of been a, a West Coast to Montreal person. Um, and I know that there's a lot of really parallel work happening at Dalhousie. So I'm really excited to get to know some of you. <laughs>